Well, good evening. And welcome to worship of the living God. Preparation for worship this evening is from, from Martin Luther. Got a, just a minor typo in there. Um, before I read it, I'll tell you a little bit about my mom's dad. My mom's dad, Grandpa McCallum, Grandpa Mac was a, an executive with GM. Um, so he did, did quite well. It was also exceedingly generous, but I was also somewhat terrified of, of him. Um, kids often have that with their grandfathers for some reason. they a little bit scared of them. But exceedingly generous, so whenever I'd ask for something, he would be super excited to give it, but I was pretty scared to ask. And it's because I thought I needed to somehow convince him. I'm like an eight-year-old trying to f- convince a, a 65-year-old man of, well, could you give me this? Could we go to this restaurant together? And that's what Luther's talking about here. Um, it's saying prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. So the idea of prayer, as Jesus taught us with, right before the Lord's Prayer, it's not as if you're trying to convince a very reluctant God to, to finally be nice. But you're just laying hold of God's willingness to care for his people. A call to worship along those lines, thinking about the Father's willingness. We're going to remember the only reason we seek him is because he seeks us. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So the reason you're seeking the Father is because the Father seeks you. Let's go to him in, in silent prayer. Father, we do ask that we would be here to lay hold of your your willingness that we'd have the proper proper attitude toward you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening we're going to be spending time in prayer, and we'll stand together singing Sweet Hour of Prayer, first two verses. This God who cares about your cares welcomes you with these words. May grace be yours, may God's mercy be yours, and may it rest upon you. And these come from the Spirit and from the Son and from the Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And please be seated. Tonight we've got our prayer service, doing a little bit different this year. I give you all the, often we have different folks pray for different areas. I thought this year we would have give you advance notice and lift up different requests. So right now it's for the area of planting and jobs. Um, 
anything to do with planting and jobs. Otherwise, you're going to have somebody who knows minimal things about farming praying for things that won't be helpful. Garrett. We thank the Lord for the moisture that he sent this winter. I hate snow. But the Lord sends us blessings in some ways that we don't. Not exactly how we always want it, but he sends his blessings. I could tell how dry it was, and then I never heard one person complain about the snow all winter, so I figured we must have been quite dry. <laughs> anyway. Indeed. Indeed. Well, if Galen Vandevecht adds his amen, that, that'll be good. No. Nathan. Indeed. People gainfully employed. New business is coming to the community. It's a lot to be thankful for. So planting and jobs. Michael. Indeed. Safety on the roads and in the fields. Joshua. Indeed. Kids graduating and trying to find jobs. Karen. Yep. Indeed. Patience for the farmers. That's indeed. Everybody's favorite virtue to learn. Anything else for planting and jobs? Gotcha. Employment. Think an ample opportunity to, to serve. Think in Fellowship Village. After we pray together, we'll just remain seated, and right after I say amen, Jane, we'll just go right into uh, now thank we all our God. Let's go together to our God in prayer. And Father, we are very grateful for the moisture. Father, we know that you care for us. It's not always in the, the forms that we, that we would so desire, but we have much to be thankful for as we think about moisture levels. And Father, we ask that we would have patience for the farmers as they, they wait for the fields to, to be able to be in a good situation to plant. And Father, we pray for safety in the, in the fields and on the roads in this coming planting and, and harvest year. And Father, as well, we do thank you for, for opportunities to, to work. Father, we think about those who would long to work but can't. We think about those who, who don't have employment. We pray for ample employment. We thank you for new businesses that have come to town, and we thank you for the benefit that it is in our community. And Father, we pray for continued opportunities to, to be working. We think about places like Fellowship Village. And Father, we ask that you would be matching the, the right people with the right jobs. We pray particularly for those who are graduating and thinking about finding jobs. Father, how easy it is for, for us if we were already in a, 
a line of work to forget what that was like. And that's uh, often a trying time. Not that you don't have it all planned out, but it's hard for us to know how you do have it all planned out. And so, Father, we ask that you would give ample employment and give a sense of purposeful employment to all. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. We're going to be praying for community, our community, and for schools. Our community and for schools. Heidi. It's a long distance relationship, man. Man, that's great. So, five, so it's six students total then from Western in the Netherlands. So, uh, Exchange students that they would be a good witness. Yeah, I remember going to the Netherlands. I kind of assumed it would kind of just be like Christian Reformed Church everywhere, and then you're there, and it's a little, little bit different. Um, that's great. Pray for, for safety and that they would be a good learning experience. It's like daily letters, man. That's what you got to do. No. Our community and schools. Indeed, local officials, we think about the, the mayor, think about council, men on the council. In some ways, it's probably easier to be a national official than a local official, so. Yes, indeed. Local fire department and EMTs, that is wonderful in this area. Chief, that doesn't mean the chief fire fire should get a, get a big head out of this, all right? Let's... Yes. Yes. 
safe in school and on buses. Indeed, it's easy to take those things for granted. The community center. Indeed. Took a walk by the community center again this last week. Pray for wisdom for all involved. So, excellent, sir. And it's right in the name of schools and community. So that's extra points for you. Hudson. Understood. Pray for my dad, Grandpa Eisinga, with his with his foot. He had surgery. That's right. He had gone to a school, and he lives in a community. So we're gonna count. Anybody else? March. Indeed. Pray for school board members. Schools, community. Bethany. Anything else? All right. Let's go together to our God in prayer, and we'll just start with the next song right after we pray. Father, thank you for the the schools and the community this morning as we thought about Christian education. And Father, we lift up Inwood Christian, we lift up West Lyon, we Ask that, Father, if any, for any teaching positions that are, are needed, there be godly people brought in to, to those positions. Father, we pray for safety in the schools. Also on uh, the buses, Father, it's in many ways a day and age that would be utterly bewildering to people 50 years ago in that regard. That, Father, we would even need to, to ask for such things as safety in the, the schools, but, Father, that's a very real and in present danger. So, Father, we ask for safety. Pray for safety on the buses as kids are traveling to and, and fro and as parents are bringing kids and dropping them off. Father, we think about opportunities in school. We think about the, the six Western Exchange students who are able to be in the Netherlands right now. And, Father, that's uh, an opportunity I would imagine that each of them will look back over their, their entire life. We ask that they would learn a good deal about what it is to be in a different culture. We ask that they would be a good witness for you. Father, we think about what what statistics are are like in a place like the the Netherlands for, for those who follow you, and we know you certainly do have a remnant who are following you very faithfully there. There's many who aren't. So, Father, perhaps you're giving these these young people an opportunity to give the, the reason for the hope which they have. Father, we pray for those making decisions regarding schools, for, for board members. We ask that you would give them wisdom and, and insight. We think about challenges they face and opportunities they have as well. Father, we pray for, for our community. We think about our, our mayor, and those who are on the council, and other local officials. We thank you for their work. We thank you for the, the excellent work of the local fire department and the EMTs and the ways that, that they help. And Father, we don't take them for, for granted. We think this year particularly about the, the community center with all the, the, the collapse of the, the roof. And Father, challenges that presents and opportunities that, present, that presents and also challenges those opportunities present and opportunities those challenges present. It's a difficult thing. But, Father, we ask that you would give wisdom. And, Father, we pray for my own dad as well, that you would be healing his, his ankle. And, Father, we, we ask all of this in the, the name of your Son. 
Amen. All right, if I could have the three-year-olds through kindergartners come forward for children and worship. And the Bonamas are up front. Hello, Harper. Ingles, we got them from all angles here. All right, and may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may he be very, very gracious unto you, and may the Lord lift up the light of his smile upon you, and may he give you peace. Amen. You go in peace. going to stand together to prepare to hear God's word. We'll be singing, Lord, let my heart be good soil. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. going to be reading verses 11 through 12. With this, meaning everything in verses 5 all the way through 10, so with this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours, and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, we, we're mere beginners in the, the ways of prayer. And Father, some of us in any number of circumstances and trials and troubles, we certainly learn to, to flex muscles of prayer. And as we do so, we realize what beginners we are and that there's much to learn. 
Father, we thank you for your servant, Paul. We thank you for the numerous prayers that are recorded of his in Scripture. Thank you for the Psalms and how much we can learn about speaking to you through them. Father, we ask that we might be those who learn a bit and perhaps more than a bit as we think about prayer this evening. And that we might be those who might be a a little quicker to, to run to you with our concerns rather than to worry or to stew. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Prayer changes things. Right? That's what we say about prayer. Prayer changes things. We say that, and we we rightly say that. But often what prayer wants to change is, is you. And often what prayer wants to change is me. If I throw out a a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull me to the shore? It was the way one missionary oversimplified it. The idea is, okay, am I really changing God or is God changing me so I want what he wants? And there's more to it. But prayer changes things and a lot of what needs to change is me. When I pray, a lot of what needs to change is you. When, when you pray, where we're not very good at, at wanting what God wants. And that's what's going on when we study Paul's words here. He's talking about prayer changing the Thessalonians. So we're going to pray that God would work, right? Because prayer, prayer changes things. That's why we're at a prayer service. It's not a sense of, well, we should, should do this or we'd feel awkward. No, we think prayer changes things, but part of what it changes is, is you and me. And so the claim of the sermon is we're going to pray for God to work, but that part of the work would be in you, part of the work would be in me. And we begin to see this this work in our first point, which is praying for for God's power. Uh, It's kind of, from what I can tell, a really good day for the trades. Kyler, you're heading into the the trades. You think about, it's really a good season to head into the trades because there's opportunities, there's excellent training for it, there's ample work to be done, and therefore often the, the salaries are, are good. But the way that you train in a trade is you wind up apprenticing under somebody. My father's in the trades, he, he apprentice under somebody. And so you do what they do. You, you watch them. And they say, well, this is how I do this. And you just keep learning from them. If you're a plumber, you learn from the master plumber. Now, what you have in Paul is you have a master prayer. And so you, the goal is to, to apprentice under him. To say, well, why does he pray for what he prays for? How does he pray? I mean, if you want to learn to grow in any skill, whether it's being an electrician, whether it's being a plumber, whether it's being a bricklayer, whether it's praying, you find somebody who does it well, and you learn from them. Now, we, we, we don't tend to like that because each of us tends to just want to do things really well right off the bat, especially something like prayer. But the reason the Bible includes so many prayers of Paul, so you can learn. So I can learn. I mean, there's no dead parts in Scripture. They're all, part, they're all there for a reason, something for you to learn from. And Paul's prayer has to do with changing us, changing the Thessalonians, changing the, the people of Larchwood, changing the people of Canton, changing the people of Inwood. I mean, to the church that gathers at 305 East Madison, and God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. I could say something like that. You need this word just as badly. I need this word just as badly as the Thessalonians did. Because, right, we want things changed. Live in a world that's not the way that it should be. So prayer changes things. And part of what changes is us, and change is it's necessary because there's, there's a standard. Last week was the, the Pinewood Derby race, which is always a whole lot of, of fun. I mean, it's down to like the, the thousandths of a second. That's kind of my read, Joel. Is that the fair to say? The thousandths of a second is how far the Pinewood Derby goes. 
Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's not too many dead, dead ties when you get down to the thousandths of a second. But Pinewood Derby, there's a standard, right? Six ounces. That, that's as heavy as your car can be. That, that's the standard. You want to get as close to that standard as you can. And so if your car's over, you yeah, needs to drop weight. It's got to be as close to that standard as possible. Not that there's a standard for you. There's a, there's a standard for me. The standard is what Paul has in mind in verse 11 when he says, with this in mind, he's talking about the standard he's been talking about in the final judgment as the, the moment. Just like at the Pinewood Derby, you come and you put your car on there and you see, okay, is it six ounces or under? That's your, your, your judgment. Now, Paul's been talking about this final judgment for people when you get put on that scale. And he's saying, okay, with, with this in mind, so he's praying that the Thessalonians come near the, the standard. Um, and he prays this for the, for the same reason. At the, at the Pinewood Derby, I saw there was a father. They were, he's weighing the car, and then he's got a, a DeWalt drill, and he's drilling in because he's kind of taking some of the weight out. But why does he do that? He does that because he really loves his son. And he wants his son to be able to race his car. He wants the big night to go well for his son. That's why Paul prays for the Thessalonians. He wants the big day, judgment day, to go really well for them. That's with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of His calling. So this idea of calling, that, that's grace all over that sentence. Now we tend to get caught up with being worthy of the calling and, and am, I, am I worthy? There are certain personality types that are always asking that. They're always looking for some fault in themselves, something to beat themselves up for. Maybe that's your personality, that, the temperament you've got. What you need to hear here is this the fact that God calls you, make you worthy of His calling. He's already called you by His grace. You're, you're His. Now He's making you worthy of that. He's making you more and more what you are by His grace if you belong to Him. And that, that's the area to put the focus is not how are all the different ways I fall short and the way that I know I'm super spiritual is I, nobody beats themselves up more than me so nobody's more spiritual than me. That's, that's, not, that's not how to do it. You, you look for signs of God working, getting you closer to the standard. You rejoice in that. But also, if you've got a different personality style, a different temperament, you might be somebody that, that presumes on grace. The idea, well, no transformations needed. God, God loves me the way that I am. And here Paul's praying for the Thessalonians and we're praying for each other to, to come closer to the standard because the idea that you can just rest in saying, well, I belong to God so everything's just, just fine. If that, that's not the right attitude either. It's a reminder that you're, you're loved as you are. But part of that love is not letting you remain the way you are. Right, that's how it would go in marriage. Bethany and I just helped lead a, a marriage conference. If there's a sense of one of you sinning, yeah, that there is love, but it's not saying, well, since I'm loved, I, I, I can just remain in this. I could just keep doing this because, well, they, they love me. Well, if it's not according to the standard, then no, you, you, you change that. You don't want to presume upon your spouse's love. You want to honor it. So that's what Paul's asking for. He's asking for God to be working that in the Thessalonians. And that's what he, why he says he prays constantly. He says we pray constantly for you. Um, people often get tripped up on this idea of praying constantly. Like, like how, do I, how do I do that? I feel really bad because I'm not praying all the time. Like sometimes I turn on my car and then I'm driving. And I'm not even, not even praying when I'm backing up because I'm kind of worried about hitting, taking my mirror off in the garage. Okay, well, the idea of praying constantly here likely is Paul has most likely three big times of prayer that he does every day. The, the Jews had that. You got your morning prayers, your noon prayer, your night prayers. And Paul's saying, every time that I'm praying throughout the, those different times, I'm thinking about you. Right, that, that helps. I had somebody I had visited this last week who had something going on at a particular time, and okay, I'm going to pray for you at that time. You know that you're being prayed for. 
So that's Paul, and he's praised because they need it. That's why he says we constantly pray for you. It's a reminder that you need prayer. You could rephrase that as we're constantly asking for help on your behalf. The idea there is you, you need help. And I need help. No, none of us like to admit that, right? We all like to help others. We don't like to be those who need help. But here Paul is saying, I'm asking for help for you because you need it if you're going to become like that 6.0 ounces. As Calvin put it, they may, that they may know that they need continual help from God, Paul declares that he prays on their behalf. Everybody in this sanctuary needs prayer. Right? The idea is you're so bad off, and I'm so bad off that we need God's help. That's being poor in spirit. So that's why we pray. And this pray is about the, the work of God in us. You, you see this where Paul says that by God's power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Um, what's really lovely about that, especially if you grew up Reformed, I grew up Reformed, People who grow up Reformed tend to think, they tend to take total depravity as the sense that everything I do and think all the time is wrong. So the best thing I should do is feel bad about anything and everything in me. And that's how I know I'm spiritual. But that's, not, that's not what total depravity is. It's about, it's, that's about our unwillingness and inability to turn to God. But, I mean, grace and also common grace says, okay, there's a lot rolling around in you that is good by God's grace. And of course, if you're a child, you're becoming more and more like him. So there are really things in you that are good that God puts there, but that's really you. The love that you have for your kids really is good. Yeah, are there elements in it that, that could be refined and changed? Yes, but what, why do our minds tend to go there? Why not actually recognize that God's actually changing us so what comes out of us is a bit more like what comes out of him? I mean, if, you were, if, you, if you've got kids, don't you totally rejoice when they start to behave in ways that are, that are honorable, that are patient, that are kind? Yeah, they're not doing it perfectly, but you're super excited because there's virtues in them that are starting to come out. Now, that's the Father with you. This is what Paul's saying here. By God's power, may He fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, we've been thinking about for chapter 5 and chapter 6 having a really good sin detector. That's what Jesus is teaching. You have a really good sin detector in a sense of saying, be drawing lines to make sure that you're not sinning. Okay, I haven't crossed this line, so I'm not sinning. And also making sure your religion's about God rather than about other people. That's a good sin detector, but what about a grace detector? Can you see ways in which God works in and through you? Can you think about ways that, okay, God's changing me so I'm a little more like Him? That I've got particular desires that are more like His desires than they were five years ago? That there are deeds that I do, decisions I make, that I would not make apart from His grace. Now Paul's saying you pay attention to those. Now that might be uncomfortable. We're going to take a little pause in a bit because I want you to think about these things in your life. And for some of you, it might be exceedingly uncomfortable because you're concerned that this would lead to pride. Right, that's, that's a good concern. But you, you don't want to be more spiritual than Scripture. And Scripture says, he may, may He fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. So think about it. What is something, Just you don't need to say it, of course, but just think about it. What is a good purpose of yours that God would have no reason not to fulfill? Because it's really just like His purposes. And those are really in you. They're in you by grace. 
All right, we certainly don't want to be prideful, but there's nothing prideful about recognizing that you are somebody who is being transformed. So prayer changes things, and you're one of the things that changes. And that's power. Now we'll go to glory. That's our second point, praying for God's glory. Now why do you do what you do? Right? Why do you farm, honestly? Like, think that through. Why, why do you actually farm? Is it because you even want to farm? Or is it, okay, you know what, I kind of don't mind it, but I kind of wished I was doing this. But I'm kind of stuck doing it. Or is it saying, you know what, I, there's really nothing I would rather do. Or why do you take care of the grandkids on Wednesdays? Like, why? Well, there's probably about ten different reasons you take care of the grandkids on Wednesdays. It's not always totally comfortable to, to examine all the reasons why we do what we do. But the, the unexamined life is, is not worth living, as Socrates put it. So why do you pray? That, that's what Paul's talking about here. Why do you actually pray? We've already prayed twice. We're going to pray twice more, but why? When Paul says why he prayed for the Thessalonians, he says, we pray this so the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. What what Paul prays is the Thessalonians that they might meet this 6.0 ounce standard more and more, might get ever closer to that. And he says that would glorify God. All right, that's what that is. When that kid puts that Pinewood Derby on that car on that scale and it's as close as possible but under to 6.0 ounces, that's a sense of glory for that kid right there. All right? When the, when the Van Beeks almost swept the entire trophy, trophy roll, all right? The great glory for the, the Van Beeks on such a night there. And the, fast, the fastest one is right, right there. I can see him right there. That thing, that thing was like, I don't know, it was almost on fire. That's how fast it was. I was terrified to be in the same building with it. But that's, that, that's a proper sense of glory for the maker. That's, what you, that's, that's, what God, that's why he made you. You give him glory. That's what you were created to do. It, it's a bit like a screwdriver. You could turn a screwdriver around and you could bang in nails with a handle. You could do that. It wouldn't be good for the screwdriver. It wouldn't be good for the nails. You can use yourself for things other than giving glory to God. It won't be good for you. That's what we call sin. Just using yourself for something other than you were created for. You're going to mess yourself up. That's sin. Glorifying God, doing it for God, doing it the way that the new husband giddily does whatever he can for his new wife. That's how you're created to live. That's your sweet spot. That's everybody's sweet spot, whether they know it or not. That's, that's McShane. How sweet it is to work for God all day and then lie down at night beneath his smile. So that's, that's giving glory to God, and that's your glory. That's what this is about when it says, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. All right, this is about God's glory, but it's about your glory. And this is where it gets very uncomfortable for some people because the idea that God wants me to have glory, that God wants to glorify me, there's no way to get around it in Scripture. I mean, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also good as glorified. I mean, there, there is glory for God's people. You can't get away from that. But some of us are rightly wary of that because we're a wary of pride. We certainly see that, yeah, pursuing glory usually goes really poorly for people. And we read passages like, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be, be the glory. And we, we take those seriously. But then you've got other passages that say, well, God's going to glorify his people. And that's one of them here. Is, that's part of prayer. So what do you do with that? Uh, I think it's... Paul's praying for the Thessalonians. Not only that God might be glorified in them, but that they might have the glory of being that car that's at 6.0000000000 ounces. 
Like our car clocked in this year at zero, zero, zero. Well, actually, it was only two decimals, but 6.00 ounces. That was a really good feeling. That, that's glory for that car. And Paul's praying that. The Thessalonians, and we pray tonight that you might have that thrill of saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ever closer to the standard. You can think about it as a God's glory as a not, you getting glory as a knock-on effect. Um, it's a bit like when coffee was introduced to Europe. Um, before coffee was introduced to Europe, people would, would rarely drink water because they didn't really know all the different germs that came from water. They just knew that water was something that would lead to dysentery, lead to all sorts of horrible diseases, so you just don't drink it. What they drink is they drink a lot of beer and they drink a lot of wine. Which means most Europeans were on some level of drunk throughout most of the portions of the day. That, that's just kind of how it went. Not totally sober people in medieval Europe. And so coffee comes along, and guess what? They start boiling water to drink with coffee. And they're drinking less beer, and they're drinking less wine. So they're sober. And they're not sick because they boiled the water. And not too long after the introduction of coffee, you get all sorts of philosophical advances because people tend to think straighter when they're not throwing up and when they're not drunk. Well, that's just a knock-on effect of, of coffee being introduced. Nobody thought, hey, let's get the enlightenment, let's bring some coffee over here. No, it just was a knock-on effect. And that's how you get in glory by glorifying God works. You become like what you worship. That, that's just life. That's why people who are really into money start to see everything else, including themselves, in terms of the bottom line. Because you become like whatever you worship. And so you worship God. He's glorious. You become glorious. But this is a gift. And here we're wrapping it up because that's the end of the passage. According to the grace of our God and Savior Jesus and the Lord Jesus Christ, you can say according to the gift of our Lord and God. Now you can be, you can be changed. That's a gift. It's a gift to be changed and prayer changes things. And prayer changes you. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we come before you knowing that we all do need to be changed. Thessalonians needed it. But Father, that's not a sign that we're not loved. It's a, it's a sign that we're loved. And Father, we ask that you would be changing us according to your ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together to sing in response, Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
Please be seated. I hit that D and that A note together, though. Luke, did you hear that? I was, I mean, I only know that because I looked at the staff notes. I kind of go up and down. That's how I do it. And I sing loud and up and down. So, all right, we're going to go with, we're going to be praying for our nation and our world. And after we pray, we'll sing to the hills, I lift my eyes from Psalm 121. So our nation and our world. Garrett. Pray for our president and our leaders that they may look to the Lord when they have decisions to make. Indeed. President and leaders, look to the Lord with decisions to make. Nation and world. Helma. Yeah, there's no shortage of natural disasters, huh? We're just kind of working our way down the row here. Russia and Ukraine. Yes, we will certainly pray for Russia and Ukraine as well. Anybody else in this row? No. Jonathan. Persecuted Christians, we will certainly pray for them. Nation and world. Dale. Indeed. Think about our missionaries and Spreading God's word to the world. Thank you, sir. Indeed, the. Are, are you going with a youth group or a different one then? Different one. Well, we've got an offering for justice for all this very day, Gerald. And now we offer Gerald Ward as part. We'll just get in that offering bag, all right? That would be something to see. Oh. So we got the youth group mission trip. That's Kansas City. That's right. Okay. Anything else? Oh, Jacqueline. Indeed. Were your relations ever to get able to get back there to do mission work, or is that? No, they live in Sioux Falls now. Okay. They still go for like a week at a time. Yeah. Haiti is indeed a chronically troubled country. Nation and world. All right, after we pray, we'll sing together Psalm, Psalm 121, To the hills I lift my eyes. And Father, we thank you for this nation in which we live. Father, with all our various faults, we are very thankful to be, to be part of it, and we pray for the welfare of, of us. Father, we pray for our president. We pray for our leaders that they might look to you decisions to make when we turn on the news, Father, it seems that you're absent and that people loom large, leaders loom large. Names like Biden and names like Xi and names like Putin, those seem like they control everything and that's not how it goes by any stretch of the imagination. Father, we ask that leaders might look to you. Pray that for our nation. Father, as we think about Putin, we think about Russia, we think about Ukraine. Father, we ask for a uh, Good and timely resolution there. We can't begin to imagine what it would be like if we as a, as a country were at war with, with Canada for the amount of time that those two have been at war. Can't begin to imagine the effects that would have on families, the families of soldiers. 
And Father, we think about nations that have unrest. We think about Haiti. We think about the natural disasters and the, the corruption that are in that land. And Father, those five-year-olds are just as precious as our five-year-olds. Those 15-year-olds have questions about their lives just like our 15-year-olds do. And Father, we ask for, for good for that land. We think about opportunities that go on to help others. We think about the mission trip to Kansas City with the youth group and also the, the work of Justice for All and Gerald going there this week. And the missionaries who are spreading your word to the, the world, Father, we ask that that would be of, of great help and eternal help, Father, in the ways that we've been eternally helped by you and also by the work of, of others who have told us about you. Father, we think about the, the effect that often has is knowing about you and lands and, Father, perhaps our own sooner rather than later. We think about persecution of, of Christians and, Father, we ask for, Father, they might know what indeed your son said, that, okay, happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake because in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, a sign of being genuine. And Father, we ask all of this as well, Father, praying for thinking about natural disasters in the sense of recovery from them and tornadoes. And Father, we, we ask for speedy recovery. We think about the work of the, the Red Cross and, and others who help as well as World Renew. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Final category is home and church. Home and church. Heidi. Oh man, congratulations. Got engagement this weekend. Probably too soon to ask how he did it. Probably not in front of everybody. That probably wouldn't be the best place to do that. Man, congratulations. Man. Indeed, Bethany and I had led a marriage conference over the, the weekend and there's certainly any number of folks that, that do need help. Yes, 50 years of marriage for Gerald and Jane Swart. Did you, did you know that, Jane? Okay. Yeah, very few people get married at the age of eight, but it pays off, huh? It 
Congratulations, sir. Home and church. Jonathan. Yes, for James and Jude. Home and church. Chinoja? All right. Hey, did you have another one, buddy? Or are you rubbing your head? Anybody else home in church? Michael. Thank you for you and Ellen, but I don't know how you pray for me. We're grateful to you. Thank you. home and church. All right, let's go to our God in prayer. Father, I come before you knowing that you are a God who is in charge of all things, including each of us. And Father, we think about any number of reasons for rejoicing. We think about, Father, a, a Van de Stroot home being established. Father, what a gift that is. Father, we ask that 50 years from now, be looking back and, and rejoicing. We think about that with his warts, in his ward household, with 50 years of marriage. And Father, we pray for thinking about, um, as we rejoice with those who rejoice, Father, we also think about how painful it is when marriage has troubles. We think about those who are struggling. We think about the work that Bethany and I were able to to do through the art of marriage over this last weekend. And we think about particular couples that are having struggles, and there's many other couples as well. Father, how much it hurts when home is fractured. Father, we think about other reasons that there are to, to rejoice. We think about the birth of James and the birth of Jude. We think about other, other families and those anticipating adopting, and Father, those who would love to have kids. We think about those in our congregation who are pregnant. We ask that those pregnancies would go well. Father, we do thank you for this congregation. We think about the work of the elders and the work of the deacons and those, those who are in committee, Father. We think about how industrious and, and cheerful people are able to go about their task. We think about, Father, the work of Bethany and, and myself and this church and this community. We ask that you would bless this body that it might continue to become more and more like your son. And Father, as we, we go forth throughout this, this back night back to our homes from the church, Father, we thank you for, for that connection. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please stand for God's parting blessing. After the parting blessing, we'll sing together, Lord, listen to your children praying. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in all ways. May the Lord be with you all. Amen.